welcome everyone to the Salesforce Fiscal 18 Second Quarter Results Conference Call. All lines have been placed on mute to prevent any background noise. After the speaker's remarks, there will be a question and answer session. If you would like to ask a question during this time, simply press star, then the number one on your telephone keypad. If you would like to withdraw your question, press the pound key. Thank you. I will now turn the call over to Mr. John Cummings, Senior Vice President of Investor Relations. Sir, you may begin. Thanks so much, Doris. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for joining us for our fiscal second quarter 2018 results conference call our second quarter results press release, SEC filings, and a replay of today's call can be found on our IR website at www.salesforce.com forward slash investor. With me on the call today is Mark Benioff, Chairman and CEO, Keith Block, Vice Chairman, President, and COO, and Mark Hawkins, CFO. As a reminder, our commentary today will primarily be in non-GAAP terms. Reconciliations between our GAAP and non-GAAP results and guidance can be found in our earnings press release. Also, some of our comments today may contain forward-looking statements which are subject to risks, uncertainties, and assumptions. Should any of these materialize or should our assumptions prove to be incorrect, actual company results could differ materially from these forward-looking statements. A description of these risks, uncertainties, and assumptions and other factors that could affect our financial results are included in our SEC filings, including our most recent report on Form 10-Q. With that, let me turn the call over to Mark. Okay, thank you so much, John. I really appreciate it. And before I begin uh, the script um, and uh, talking about our quarter, um, I really wanted to read you uh, something that I sent to the company last week uh, regarding uh, uh, some of the things that we've been seeing in the world. And I thought it would be appropriate if we just took one minute and just um, uh, allowed you to hear uh, these words as well. The world has watched with all of us the horrors of the last week taking place in the United States and Spain. The pure hatred that we have seen displayed is everything we all want to end. And I've been especially disheartened to see the display of symbols of hatred, including Nazi flags and salutes to KKK hoods. The horrible, tragic death of Heather Heyer was a senseless act of terror, and this hatred must end now. Salesforce is a company that is built on the values of love, equality, and generosity. We work hard every day to improve the state of the world through our own work and promote our company's mission to others. We all have to recommit to our own personal acts of love and kindness, as this is the only way to fight this pure hatred. We can all make our own choices between love and hate, and we can all love more. Now is the time for all of us to remember, love thy neighbor as thyself. Okay, thank you very much for allowing me to say that. And now I'd like to move into uh, the quarter. We had our best quarter ever, and we reached a huge milestone for the company. As you might remember, two and a half years ago, I talked about our dream of surpassing $10 billion in revenue. And at that time, we were just on a $5 billion revenue run rate. Well, I can remember how many employees and customers and partners came up to me and said, there's no way you're going to get to $10 billion. You know, what, what kind of a dream is this? And I now I'm absolutely thrilled that in the second quarter, we broke through the $10 billion run rate, doubling the company in such a short time. Now, Salesforce is the first enterprise cloud software company in the history of the industry to reach the $10 billion run rate. No competitor has pierced $10 billion this fast. Not Oracle, not Microsoft, not SAP, and certainly not with $15 billion of deferred revenue on and off the balance sheet. This makes Salesforce the fastest growing enterprise software company ever to reach this milestone. And this incredible achievement is now coupled with an incredible dream. We now have set our sights on $20 billion and doubling the company again. And you can see today how we can get there organically with our unmatched product portfolio, world-class team, and, as I mentioned, $15 billion in book business on and off the balance sheet. While this was a phenomenal quarter of growth, we continue to improve our profitability executing at scale, and we remain the fastest growing of all the top five enterprise software companies. 
Now let's talk about some of the highlights of the quarter. Revenue for the quarter rose to almost $2.6 billion, which was up 26%, and we're heading fast to $20 billion in revenue. As I mentioned, we have more than $15 billion in book business on and off the balance sheet. That's up 29% from a year ago. In fact, we added more than $3 billion to this balance since last year. Based on these strong results, we're raising full-year top-line revenue guidance by $100 million to $10.4 billion at the high end of the range, 24% growth for this dream, and I'll tell you personally, I've got dreams of 25%. This is the second quarter in a row we've raised our revenue guide by $100 million and only the third time in our history. Now, there's a reason for our incredible success year after year and why we continue to be investing at such an incredible rate to be the number one CRM company. It's because no other company like ours has ever been as committed to customer success as Salesforce, and that's reflected in how our customers are driving tremendous success for their customers. You all know that customer relationship management, whether it be B2B or B2C, has already become the most important and fastest growing enterprise software category, growing at nearly 14%, and that's going to come for years to come. Well, it's a massive $100 billion plus opportunity that Sierra Salesforce is leading, and we're in a phenomenal position going forward. We all see the trillion dollar CRM opportunity in front of us. Now, we see that by our, through our number one position, and that's because we're number one in CRM, number one in sales, number one in service, number one in marketing, and we have the number one platform, that we have a tremendous opportunity to deliver on these goals. And we're delivering this at a scale every single day, creating nearly 3 million sales opportunities, more than 5 million customer cases, sending 1.4 billion emails, processing a million purchases, and producing 40 million reports and dashboards every single day. That's a billion reports and dashboards a month, by the way. All the while delivering more than 5 billion platform transactions a day. And it's no wonder that Forbes just named Salesforce the most innovative company in the world again. We were the first to bring innovations like cloud and social and mobile to CRM, and now we're the first to deliver artificial intelligence to all of our customers with Einstein right inside our core platform, across all of our products. This is a massive trillion-dollar growth opportunity. According to IDC, the combination of CRM and IA, C, excuse me, according to IDC, the combination of CRM and AI will create more than a trillion dollars in new GDP impact worldwide, 800,000 net new jobs by 2021. Amazing. And we're already seeing how Einstein is a game changer for customers, delivering hundreds of millions of critical insights, recommendations, and predictions every single day. But our biggest advantage is the more than 27,000 talented employees of Salesforce, these incredible people who are focused on making our customers successful with our products. No other company can match this level of focus on the CRM market. All of this adds up to Salesforce, becoming increasingly strategic to our customers and to our partners who are trusting us to bring them into this incredible new future. You'll hear more about that in a second from Keith. While it's only August, we're officially on the road to Dreamforce, which is going to take place in San Francisco November 6th through 9th. And it's going to be the most exciting, most inspirational, and most innovative Dreamforce ever, and I hope all of you can be there. You're not going to want to miss one moment. Okay, Keith. Thanks, Mark. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. As you can see from our results, Q2 was another outstanding quarter across the board. It's clear that our strong execution and commitment to customer success are enabling us to build deeper and more strategic relationships with companies around the world of all shapes and sizes. In every conversation I have with CEOs, they mention growth as their number one priority. And getting closer to their customers is a key driver of that growth. That's why Leading companies like Amazon or 21st Century Fox or Jeffrey's Investment Bank, Samsung, all of them chose Salesforce this quarter to drive their digital transformation. And one of the largest automakers is also going wall-to-wall -wall with Salesforce, building a seamless brand experience for our consumers across all touch points and channels. 
Today, eight of the top 10 automakers around the world rely on Salesforce for their digital transformations. We also expanded with one of the world's leading logistics and transformation, uh, transportation firms to transform the way that they deliver service to their millions of customers worldwide across every channel, social, mobile, and the web. We continue to establish and grow relationships with marquee brands and unlock new value for our customers by delivering innovative solutions and executing on three key priorities, expanding internationally, focusing on industries, and growing our partner ecosystem. Now, our international growth continues to represent a huge opportunity for Salesforce as we march towards that $20 billion plus goal that Mark mentioned. We continue to make significant investments in our international go-to-market resources, our operations, and our infrastructure to serve our global customers. In fact, more than 40% of our new hires year-to-date have been outside the United States. And in Q2, Salesforce went live on Amazon's cloud infrastructure in Canada. Very, very exciting. Customers can now uh, access Salesforce locally via the AWS Canada region. And Amazon continues to be an incredible partner as we expand in Canada as well as Australia. These investments contributed to our outstanding international results this quarter with constant currency revenue growth of 31% in EMEA and 27% in APAC, complementing our strong and consistent growth of 24% in the Americas. In APAC, we had a very strong quarter in Japan, closing deals with established companies including Toshiba and Nomura. And we had some great wins in Australia with Queensland Urban Utilities and Australia Post. In Europe this quarter, we entered into new relationships with Caring, one of the world's top luxury groups. I think everybody was excited about that one. Uh, Salesforce will be their clientele solution across all their brands, including Gucci and East Saint Laurent. We also expanded with Carrefour, the region's second largest retailer, formed a new relationship with Group Auchan, and we closed a strategic commerce cloud deal with Sephora Europe. All good stuff, and clearly the leading retailers of the world continue to turn to Salesforce. In fact, companies are coming to Salesforce as their trusted partner in digital transformation. Speaking of trust, we are committed to helping our customers comply with the forthcoming GDPR, including a GDPR website, a new trailhead module, and a contractual addendum to assist our customers with compliance. This fall, we will be publishing product-specific best practices, and we'll have several sessions at Dreamforce. Now, let's turn to industries. You've already heard about our momentum in retail. We had a great quarter with retail, and we're very, very proud of those results. But we're also expanding our relationships in financial services with T. Rowe Price, New York Life, and HSBC. T. Rowe Price chose the Financial Services Cloud to deliver personalized, highly relevant service to clients across every channel. New York Life, a great customer, doubled down rolling out Sales Cloud and Service Cloud to another 6,000 agents and customer service specialists. And HSBC will leverage Marketing Cloud globally across its retail and wealth management divisions to create personalized banking experiences for their customers. In the public sector, the Department of Veteran Affairs, which is working hard to improve services for veterans, expanded with Service Cloud, Analytics, and Platform in the quarter. Lastly, in Health and Life Sciences, we had a very large expansion with one of the top pharmaceutical companies in the world. And today, 15 of the world's 20 largest pharmaceutical firms rely on Salesforce. Our success in the quarter was driven by our ability to speak the language of our customers, and that is translating into outstanding industry momentum for us. Now, as Salesforce grows, so does the opportunity for our partners. Salesforce partner certifications have increased 5x in the last four years, and partners are investing more in their Salesforce practices. Accenture is actually a great example. In Q2, they expanded their Salesforce capabilities in the federal market, and they're also leveraging the Salesforce platform to provide vertical solutions across many industries. I'm sure you all saw the announcement that Accenture will provide trade promotion and marketing operations for Unilever, all of which is built on the Salesforce platform. Now, before I close, I want to give you a quick update on the integration efforts. We've moved quickly to integrate both products and operations across the companies that we acquired in FY17, including Demandware, Quip, and Crux, and it's clear that our integration efforts are absolutely paying off. In the case of Demandware and Crux, these products have not only enhanced our B2C product offerings and expanded our total adjustable market, but they've also accelerated our growth. So to close, I'd like to thank our partners and our customers for their continued trust in us, and of course, our 27,000 employees who are laser focused on making our customers successful every single day. Now, I'd like to hand the call over to Mark Hawkins, who will share a bit more about our financial execution in the quarter. Mark? Well, thank you, Keith. And as you've heard from Mark and Keith, we delivered a great second quarter. Revenue grew 26% in dollars and 25% in constant currency, excluding a year-over-year FX tailwind of approximately $7 million. 
We also saw a sequential tailwind of approximately 23 million. Our portfolio of products performed extremely well in the quarter with balanced year-over-year -year revenue growth across the board. Sales cloud growth accelerated to 17%, driven principally by core Salesforce automation and continued traction of Salesforce CPQ. Service cloud continued to outpace the market with 21% growth. This is a slight uptick in growth uh, from last quarter, reflecting the investments we've made in the product and sales enablement. Platform and other grew 32%, where we saw especially strong growth from Heroku. Marketing cloud, excluding commerce cloud, grew 36%, passing the $1 billion run rate uh, this quarter. And Commerce Cloud contributed $63 million to total revenue with $51 million in subscription and support revenue. Dollar attrition for the second quarter, excluding Marketing Cloud and other acquired businesses, remained below 9%. We expanded our second quarter non-GAAP operating margin by 195 basis points year over year. In the quarter, operating margin benefited from an FX tailwind that was roughly offset by a margin headwind related to the fair value adjustments of demandware. Non-GAAP EPS was $0.33, cents, which was up 38% over last year. Operating cash flow was $331 million, up 32% over last year. Deferred revenue ended the quarter at $4.82 billion, up 26% in dollars and 25% in cost and currency, excluding an FX tailwind of $32 million. On a sequential basis, deferred revenue benefited from an FX tailwind of $17 million. Commerce Cloud contributed $54 million to deferred revenue in Q2. Moving on to guidance, starting with revenue. Coming out of another quarter of outstanding performance, we once again are raising our full-year FY18 revenue guidance by $100 million to $10.35 to $10.4 billion for 23 to 24% growth year over year. We are also raising our FY18 GAAP diluted EPS guidance of seven to nine cents and non-GAAP diluted EPS guidance of $1.29 to $1.31. It's important to note that coming out of a strong second quarter, we are accelerating our investments and in expanding our distribution capacity, new product initiatives, and trailhead. These investments are set up for the long-term growth while uh, pressuring our near-term uh, near margins. Nevertheless, we remain on track to deliver 125 to 150 basis points of non-GAAP operating margin improvement in FY18, despite a slight FX headwind. These investments are critical to sustaining our long-term growth and leadership in the largest and most important market in enterprise software. And at the same time, we are mindful of how important profitability is to our investors, and we remain committed to ongoing margin improvement year after year and our long-term non-GAAP operating margin target in the mid-30s. Turning to cash flow, uh, we are maintaining our full-year operating cash flow growth guidance of 20 to 21 percent year-over-year. Among other items, this guidance considered, one, uh, a strong new business in the second quarter, which drove higher cash commission obligations, and two, the fact that Q4 is our second largest cash collection quarter. So without the benefit of that quarter, it's difficult to further refine this full projection at this time. That said, we are closely managing our capital expenditures in the second half of the year and now expect FY18 CapEx as a percent of revenue to be approximately 5%. In context, we expect free cash flow to grow faster than operating cash flow for the full year. For Q3, we're expecting revenue of $2.64 billion to $2.65 billion, gap diluted EPS of $0.04 cents to $0.05, cents, non-gap diluted EPS of $0.36 to $0.37, cents, and year-over-year -year deferred revenue growth of 18 to 19 percent. This deferred revenue uh, guide reflects the continued deepening of invoicing seasonality that we've been discussing for the past several years. And as a reminder, this same seasonality also impacts cash flow. And one final item, we are in track with our implementation of ASC 606 for Q1 of next year. Uh, we expect to talk more about this at our analyst day at Dreamforce in November on the November 7th. And if you're interested in attending, please reach out to our investor relations team. So to close, our second quarter wrapped up a great first half of fiscal 2018. I'd like to thank our employees, our customers, our partners, and our stockholders for their continued support. And with that, we'll open up the call for questions. Ladies and gentlemen, at this time, if you would like to ask a question, press star then the number one on your telephone keypad. Again, for any questions, that is star then the number one. We'll pause for just a brief moment while we compile the Q&A roster. 
Our first question is from the line of Keith Weiss with Morgan Stanley. Excellent. Uh, thank you, guys, and very nice quarter. And also, uh, Mr. Bennion, thank you for those comments. Um, definitely, I think, needed in these times. Um, I wanted to ask a little bit about um, sort of the margin profile for FY18, sticking with the 125 to 150. Um, it, it's evident that with FX getting a little bit easier into the back half of the year, you guys see something for mental room for um, investment. I was wondering if you could drill in a little bit on the decision to sort of keep operating margin guidance where it is, and, and, and maybe as a follow-up, what are those incremental investments you uh, are planning on making to the back half of the year to offset that FX um, alleviation of the pressure? Great. Glad you. Yeah, thank you very much for asking that question. You know, I think that the, when we think about um, earnings and, and obviously we have this incredible top-line growth and, you know, there's one word that really comes to mind and that's balance, which is that it's incredibly important as we grow our company and exceed these incredible revenue targets that we also continue to grow our bottom line. And I'm sure that Mark will address the specifics of how much we've grown our bottom line in the last few years. But one of the things that continues to be um, on our minds is how, what are the ways that we can grow our margin uh, while also continuing to grow our top line? And we're absolutely committed to doing both. And I think it's on the mind of every single member of our management team. I think we've continued to deliver those numbers actually very well, and we'll continue to do that going forward. And that's also under the guise of you know, pressure that we get from foreign exchange, like every time the euro increases, you know, its, uh, its um, valuation, it puts more pressure on our... Uh, Bottom line, Mark, do you want to address Sure. That? No, I'm happy, happy to do that, Mark. Thank you, Keith, for the question. Uh, I'll address both parts of it, uh, Keith. One is the margin and one is the specifics of where we're investing. The first thing I just want to clarify is that for the full fiscal year, we're seeing a slight headwind uh, from, from an FX standpoint for the full fiscal year. Um, that's one point I want to clarify. We are maintaining the 125 uh, to 150 uh, basis point uh, improvement. Uh, again, that's consistent with you know what the guide has been on a larger base now as we raise the revenue another 100 million. Second time we've raised 100 million, as you know, it's on a bigger base, and consequently we've raised the EPS by a cent. And what we looked at in terms of the uh, opportunity is we looked at the big opportunity that Marcus talked about of over 100 billion dollars in TAM, uh, and we see that opportunity with unit economics that are very attractive in the mid you know 30s in terms of unit uh, operating margin uh, economics. And so we're pursuing that, obviously. We're investing and accelerating investing in distribution capacity, number one, Keith, very specifically, and also in new product initiatives, number two, uh, and also trailhead, number three. These are three things very specifically that we're doing to really, uh, really help us, even in the growth beyond this current year. And so that uh, is something that we're mindful of because this, this opportunity is very, very large, uh, as we described. As Mark called out, this is the, uh, the, you know, the uh, fourth year in a row of operating margin expansion, we're mindful of that. We're very uh, focused on delivering uh, this 125 and 150 plus the plus the growth. Hopefully, that gives you a little complexion yeah. of both. Yeah, Keith, do you want to address it as well? Yeah, I mean, look, I think uh, I think the marks have done a very good job articulating what our strategy is here. I think at the end of the day, uh, we see the opportunity in the marketplace. We're already the market leader, and we're expanding our share. We're taking share, uh, but we do see that opportunity. So that means that we have the opportunity to invest. Uh, and continue to invest in our innovation and our infrastructure and our customer-facing assets uh, to capitalize on that opportunity. And that's exactly uh, what our strategy is. Right. I like to think of us investing in growth by design and enhancing our profitability every step of the way. Our next question is from the line of Bavane Surrey with William Blair. Hey, guys. Thanks for taking my questions. And to echo Keith, um, Mark Benhill, thank you. Thank you for those comments. Um, it, was, it was meaningful. Um, I guess my, my, I'll ask my two questions quickly. One is, you've seen acceleration now for a couple of quarters in sales cloud, service cloud accelerated, um, despite the very, very healthy growth last year. Uh, marketing cloud and organic basis is doing really well. If you were to think about the breakout outside of cross-sell, meaning how are these clouds doing on their own? Because obviously cross-sell and Keith's business of sort of doing the enterprise deals is helping. Is there any way to understand sort of how these are doing on their own? I'd love to get a little color of sort of pure sales cloud without sort of the cross-sell um, and its growth. And then the follow-up question I had was, you know, one of the challenges you've had over years is salespeople entering data into a CRM system. And obviously Salesforce had a, you know, huge step forward above 
Siebel and Bond and the legacy solutions, and now Lightning has enabled that. But do you think sort of, Mark, as you think about sort of acquisitions or organic strategy, like natural language processing, the ability to talk to systems as opposed to sales guys entering data themselves is a path you'll go. Just have to get some color in both of those. Thank you. Yeah. Well, let me take the last question first, which is that, you know, Salesforce um, actually gets its data from a lot of different places. Um, you know, more than half of the transactions, when we talk about 5 billion transactions a day, more than half of those transactions are API transactions already. That's other computers filling our database with data. And we have just amassed a huge amount of customer data uh, based on that. We have so many integrations and so many customers have so deeply integrated. And then there's many different ways that customers get their uh, information into our system. Of course, we have many um, natural language type systems like what you've mentioned, voice type systems like you've seen us do work with Alexa, um, with Amazon, um, and uh, I think you'll continue to see an evolution of that. I, one area that I'm especially proud of is mobile. I, I don't think any enter enterprise software company has done as good a job um, with mobile as Salesforce. Uh, Salesforce has, um, with, Salesforce one, with Salesforce One, with My Salesforce One, with um, uh, a Salesforce Inbox, with many of our mobile offerings and mobile platform capabilities, more mobile capability than any other enterprise software company. And that has really allowed customers to you know, access and work with and input data in lots of new ways. Because mobile devices are empowered and enabled with so many kind of, I would say, next generation capabilities, including many operating systems that have very deep AI, as you know, all of that is already tied into Salesforce, so it's a very, you know, it's, it's extremely powerful. Let me, uh, let me try to address the first part of that question. So, you know, it's interesting. I think if you look at the history of software, most companies are lucky to have a great first act. But Salesforce is a company that's had a great first act with Sales Cloud, a great second act with Service Cloud, a great third act with Marketing Cloud, a great fourth act with um, Platform. And we continue to innovate for our customers, and we speak the language of the customer. So whether it's pure play cloud innovation, with add-ons, with just uh, pure play features and functions, or it's the solutions that we assemble by vertical. Uh, the financial services industry was a particularly strong one for us this quarter, as was retail, as was HL, uh, HLS. This gives us the opportunity to cross-sell and upsell. So the, each of these clouds by themselves would be the largest cloud company in the world or amongst the largest cloud companies in the world. So standing alone, they're very, very, very strong. They're each a market leader. Uh, but when we have the opportunity to drive digital transformation for CEOs, you know, the walls between sales, service, and marketing come down, and we have the right solutions, and that's why you're seeing these results. Our next question is from the line of Cash Rankin with Bank of America Merrill Lynch. Hi, let me echo my congratulations. One for Mark Benioff and one for uh, Mr. Hawkins. Uh, Mark, when you look at uh, your goal to double the company uh, size to $20 billion in revenue uh, organically, uh, historically you've seen uh, some of your peers like SAP, Oracle, uh, struggle to maintain that hyper growth once they hit the $10 billion mark after the ERP uh, cycle ended. Uh, what uh, have you been able to observe from history that it gives you the confidence that you can overcome those odds and uh, position uh, Salesforce to be an organic growth company, even at that level at which uh, Oracle SAP could not maintain that growth rate? And one for Hawkins, uh, I calculate your bookings margin. By the way, your bookings growth rate, if you include the off balance sheet backlog change and the on balance sheet deferred revenue, your bookings grew about 39%, truly spectacular. And I also calculate your bookings margin to be 30%. And I was intrigued when you said your unit economics were running in, in the mid-30s. Just wanted to clarify and see what you meant by that. Thank you so much. Yeah, I mean, I think that, and uh, thanks for that, Cash. I think that, you know, number one for us, here we are, we're blasting through $10 billion. All of you have your models for Salesforce. You can plug these deferred revenue numbers into your models and do your calculations of where our revenue is going to be in each of the next, you know, several years. And I'll tell you, we took our home management team off-site uh, two weeks ago to lay out our plan for what we call Chapter 3. Uh, chapter 1 for us certainly was 0 to 1 billion. It's well documented in uh, the book, uh, Behind the Cloud, how we did it, what we did, all of those capabilities. We want to write a second book now for entrepreneurs of what we did from 1 to 10 billion. We think that's an important story that needs to be told. That's certainly Chapter 2. 
uh, now we're in the chapter three, which is you know to go from 10 to 20 billion. And I'm sure all of you can see that's going to happen in fairly short order. Um, I think that one of the things that we have done to focus on and make sure that we blast through $10 billion is to focus on customer success. I think a lot of mistakes that the other entrepreneurs have made, and you know, I can go through each one, in enterprise software specifically, is not to really double down at this point, again, on the customer. Get absorbed in your own myopia. Get absorbed in your corporate politics. Get in, absorbed in your corporate bureaucracy and yourselves. And try to break out of yourself and recognize the most important thing remind, rem continues to be the customer. And how do we enable that customer and empower that customer? And, and um, you know, of course, we're going to hold ourselves accountable. And we're also going to deliver, you know, all kinds of other uh, uh, capabilities uh, along the way uh, as well. Um, but that is really our focus, which is how do we make our customers more successful uh, than ever? And uh, we, I think that's the heart of our culture. You, you know, we have a great culture at Salesforce. It's a culture built on our core values of trust, of, of uh, growth, of innovation, of equality. But um, I think that if the, nothing is more important to our company than customer success. And even though the vast majority, you know, let's say half of the 27,000 employees that work for us today probably were not with us two years ago. So that uh, is something that we really have to spend time with them that we're different than other software companies because we really are, care about that customer and we're going to make sure that customer is successful. When you're an enterprise software, you have to realize it's hard work. Not everything is going to be perfect all the time. There's going to be problems. That's why, you know, being so committed to the customer, I think, is more important than ever. And I think that's why you're going to continue to see extraordinary growth uh, for years to come because of this culture that's really driving it forward. And then we've coupled it with this incredible CRM opportunity. And I have to say, our competitors have really done a horrible job in the last few years. I, I just would say that a lot of them have abandoned the CRM market. Um, if you talk to the major CRM analysts, and we do that, we just had one of them at our, con at our management conference, they're shocked, we're shocked of how these companies have really walked out of the CRM market. Companies that had huge multi-billion dollar positions in the CRM market have ceded that market to us. And that's very exciting um, uh, when, uh, you know, we look at the huge investments that we've made, not just in product, but also uh, distribution. Uh, more than half of our organization is a customer-facing organization. We sell directly to and service directly to the customer. That is going to serve us very well for years to come. So I feel very good, and I think you can see it in the numbers here. You know, as I said, you know, we're here forecasting 24% uh, growth for the year. That's our official guidance. I have personal dreams of 25%. I think that would be amazing. No software company kind of went through the 10, uh, 10 point, $10.4 billion number at these, at these rates. And so, you know, when we chart, and we had a chart, you know, a couple weeks ago, Microsoft's growth over 30 years, Salesforce's growth, Oracle's growth, SAP's growth, and we're, wow, we are, we're really, you know, separated ourselves from those traditional growth trajectories, and I feel that that's going to continue to happen. And let me take the second part of the question. Cash, thank you for the question. Cash, I haven't seen the modeling that you've done, but let me disclose what we disclose, which is around the total book of business. You know, we have, you know, a build uh, and unbuild uh, deferred revenue totally at $15.2 The build portion, of course, grew 26%. The unbuild portion grew 30% to make up that, that total amount of our business. And as we like to think about it, that's, you know, that total... Uh, build and unbuild deferred revenue is obviously revenue waiting to happen over time. Uh, the one thing I would say to you about the unit economics, you know, if we go back to our Dreamforce presentations for the last several years, we talk about lifetime economics, the cost of book, the cost to serve, and then what that results in over time uh, is in the, uh, the mid-30s in terms of the unit economics at mature growth rates. And that's what we see uh, very specifically. That's what I can share with you. And obviously that's against a, a $100 billion market that we're pursuing. So that, that's what I would share. Our next question is from the line of Pat Walravens with JPM Securities. Uh, oh, great. Thank you. Um, Mark, first of all, you know, thank you for sharing that message and for 
standing up for what's morally right. I mean, that's great to see from corporate America. What, what I would love to hear is your thoughts on the platform strategy, um, how the environment has changed, and, and how you think the platform strategy should evolve over time. Well, the platform strategy has evolved over time, and um, I mean, you know, one of the cool things for us is we have a tremendous um, we have a tremendous uh, uh, capability uh, with our platform, and you know, that really started with this idea that we were building these amazing CRM apps like our sales and service app, but our customers wanted apps really designed for them. The traditional approach has been companies building vertical apps almost from the get-go and, and, and kind of creating these customizations and enhancements right inside the, the hardline code. That never sat well with me, uh, mostly because my background was in application development and deployment tools. So we really built uh, our platform um, in a way that let us build our core applications and let our customers um, extend them. And that is why so much metadata has been built uh, inside of Salesforce. I don't think a single customer has the same implementation of Salesforce. And yet, when we upgrade and update our software, which we do you know, three times a year, we don't break links and we don't break these customizations. And customers get Einstein and mobile and all of our enhancements, and yet they have their highly customized uh, capability. No other company in the world has that. Even today, when most companies upgrade and update their uh, core applications even in the cloud, they don't upgrade all customers uh, democratically. They kind of give customers, you know, kind of the warning, well, we're going to do this, but it's going to break your system. We don't do that. We have a way um, through our metadata architecture to really um, extend that. And then as we've acquired companies, we have um, uh, brought that platform religion to them. So when we look at... Um, our, uh, our all core, all of our core products, they all have core platforms. Platforms are incredibly important because they let customers enhance their system in in highly specialized way. Platforms are also extremely important because they drive down attrition. I think as we you know we just ran our numbers for this management conference that I mentioned two two uh, two weeks ago. You look at our attrition rate over the last ten years. One of the reasons we've been able to drive it down is because of our platform. I think one of the reasons we've been able to deliver so quickly this amazing work in financial services that Keith has led, which is the building of our financial services cloud and our financial services business unit, is um, and our success in financial services is because of our platform. It rapidly, when we figure out a market or a capability that we want to add or focus on, we can rapidly uh, deliver that. That's also true with Keith's healthcare initiative as well. And that, I think, has been a very, a very powerful uh, part of our approach. Our platform is uh, unique because not only, of course, do we have our core platform, um, which includes our sales cloud platform and our service cloud platform and our marketing cloud platform, but we also have extensions of that platform like Heroku, which is one of the most powerful and popular application development and deployment capabilities on Amazon. And we, of course, have tightly integrated that into our core platform. So customers, for example, I'm wearing this amazing new Louis Vuitton watch today. And this Louis Vuitton watch is um, connected to something called LV Pass, which is the Louis Vuitton app that helps me manage all of my Louis Vuitton products. And that is built on Heroku. And then all of the CRM data for Louis Vuitton, however, is built and managed inside our core platform. And all of it is deeply integrated. So when I walk into a Louis Vuitton store, they know who I am. They know all the products that I bought, like the watch or you know my carry-all or whatever it is that I like of their products. And I'm managing it all through that Heroku app on my phone with LV Pass. That's a great example of our platform strategy where we let customers build highly complex applications like Louis Vuitton with their Icon app. And you can see that inside any Louis Vuitton store when you go into work with a Louis Vuitton account executive, and you can see it yourself as a consumer uh, with Heroku when you use LV Pass on your phone. I hope that answers your question. I think it's great. I mean, at the end of the day, the other thing is our partners, our ISV oh, great. community. Yeah. Right? If you look at the explosion of our ISV community, we have now gotten into a situation where 
our ISVs are building mission critical apps. Just a few short quarters ago, we made a, an announcement of a, uh, a company that is actually building clinical trial management software, which is pretty interesting, okay, on top of our application. You probably saw the Unilever announcement uh, most recently with Accenture about uh, Accenture building CPG-related applications uh, on our platform. So it's, it's very, very robust for our partner community. And of course, we have our largest uh, ISV, which is Viva, which is unique uh, in the sense that it focuses just on pharmaceutical firms. Our next question is from the line of Ross McMillan with RBC. Thank you very much, and uh, Mike as well, and thank you, Mark Benioff, for the comment. Um, one from Mark Benioff for Keith to start with. Just on Einstein, I know it's still early days, but um, we started to see some you know, bigger customer announcements like Airbus and U.S. Bank. I'm just curious as to when you think Einstein actually will start to have a material impact on, on your numbers, on the results. And then a follow-up for uh, Mark Hawkins. Just um, We've raised revenue for two quarters here. We've raised EPS for two quarters here, but we didn't raise the cash flow uh, from operations growth guidance, and I just wondered if you could revisit that as to why. Thanks. Yeah, I mean, I think Einstein has hugely exceeded our expectations, and I would say, from my perspective, it's already a material part of our results. I think it's a critical part of how we differentiate our product against now all of our competitors. Because we're the first company to take the robust AI capabilities, including machine intelligence, machine learning, and deep learning, and offer that to our customers in a unified CRM platform through our sales, service, marketing, um, uh, applications, commerce applications across the board, um, that has really uh, happened faster than we expected, deep, more deeply than we've expected, and it's been more exciting for our customers than we uh, expected. I think also the branding choice that we made with Einstein um, also exceeded our expectations because it let us rapidly communicate to our customers that we've extended our core platform with artificial in, in intelligence. Uh, as we kind of head towards Dreamforce, you're going to see a lot of exciting things. Uh, with AI, I have uh, seen some amazing things in financial services. I just saw some amazing things in healthcare. I'm not going to go into the details on the call because some of the results are still early, but we've seen some amazing breakthroughs in using uh, uh, artificial intelligence with healthcare. Um, I, I think this is going to be one of the huge new drivers of growth. You can see that the cloud was a huge driver of growth for Salesforce. Mobile was a huge uh, driver of growth for Salesforce. And now you've got AI as this next uh, generation uh, system. And every company has to look at what are they using, uh, what are they doing with AI to make their customer relationships better. I, mean, I just gave you the story about Louis Vuitton. You know, Einstein is built into all of those apps, and I can tell you that helps that Louis Vuitton account executive, when I walk in the store, they're able to give me that next best offer. Um, I think it's probably one of the, the reasons, you know, that we were able to close a caring group uh, in uh, this quarter, another incredible uh, luxury brand uh, family uh, with Gucci and Bottega Veneta, because we're able to offer these companies the ability to have much better, much smarter uh, relationships and do it so unbelievably quickly. Um, I also just bought some amazing new sneakers on Adidas and uh, called Prime Net Shoes. Uh, if you haven't checked out some of the stuff they have or some of the Stan Smith tennis shoes uh, or other Yeezy 350s that they have on Adidas, and a lot of the recommendations and capabilities that you're getting already on the platform are through Einstein. So Einstein is an incredible advancement, and it's great for all of our clouds. And again, I don't think the other enterprise software companies have moved fast enough into artificial intelligence. Okay. And let me pick up the second part of the question, Ross. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, a couple of things here. One is, you know, our, our guide, you're absolutely right. We're holding that at $2.6 billion, roughly speaking. Really two things that I would elaborate on. One is that uh, we have a very distinct seasonality in uh, Salesforce. We get a lot of our cash in Q1, and then the other big cash flow quarter is in Q4. And so at, at this time, with the line of sight that we have, I think uh, it, it's better to, to wait and get better visibility than we have today. We think it's a very solid guide, and we'll revisit that in November, number one. 
Number two, I would say to you that I, I did call out a little bit in the earlier in the call, uh, but I'll elaborate a little bit. You know, we had deferred commissions, uh, the obligations on that on a cash basis because we had a strong book of business in Q2 are, you know, have an effect uh, in the year, even if the expense is capitalized over a longer period of time. And so obviously we, we try to factor things like that into it. I say the third point is just as a, a matter of reference, if you look at our trailing 12 months of operating cash flow and revenue growth, they're, they're pretty close together uh, looking back. So, you know, that's, that's where we're at today. We think it's appropriate. And lastly, uh, we are managing our CapEx tightly. And uh, we'll, uh, we'll uh, talk again in November. And our next question is from the line of Carl Kerstead with Deutsche Bank. Thanks. I've got uh, two uh, questions on two backlog numbers. Uh, first is the 30% unbilled backlog you put up. That's a fantastic number because it's actually accelerating, I think, over the last couple of quarters despite that number getting larger. So I'm wondering if you could um, uh, offer any added color. Maybe, maybe there was more multi-year deals, some larger deals. And then secondly is the 18, 19% 3Q DR growth. I guess this one would be for Mark Hawkins. Mark, you mentioned that's due largely, it's, it's obviously less than normal seasonality. Is it due entirely to the invoicing seasonality? Maybe something else going on. I, I know Dreamforce drops in 4Q this year rather than 3Q. Does that take any, any zip out of your 3Q DR growth? Thank you. Sure. Let me let me jump in, and then maybe Keith or Mark might want to add in the first one, and I'll I'll uh, close loop on the second one on the 18 to 19 percent. Uh, but you're absolutely right, uh, Carl. The uh, the uh, unbilled uh, deferred revenue at 30 percent is a slight acceleration and, and a very very big number uh, in terms of growth. You know, we have you know I think it's really reflective of a of a strong uh, business that we've been describing that Keith has been describing in his uh, in his dialogue. Uh, a large uh, set of deals over the over a long time, but just overall health across geos, across uh, clouds. Um, Keith, uh, you know, if you want to jump more into that, but I think the 30% is a slight acceleration. Carl's absolutely right. And if you want to add any more commentary, I will circle back to the 18 and 19% DR. Yeah, look, I think at the end of the day, bit of an uptick. It, it manifests itself um, in small companies and large companies, uh, but certainly we're, we're establishing uh, or we continue to establish these very, very deep, multi-year, very strategic relationships with these customers, and that's why you see these financial results. Great. Thank you, Keith. And let me just pick up the second point, Carl. Uh, in terms of the, uh, the DR at the 18 to 19 percent, this is really about the uh, deepening invoice seasonality. It just continues. And one of the things that I would call out to everyone, and I think uh, just to, to share with you, is that we have 12 years of history on our uh, webpage, our IR webpage, with supplemental information that shows every quarter for 12 years and the sequential impact, because this has been a topic we've been trying to share at Dreamforces for the past several years. But you can actually see the map and even fit in uh, the guide for this, uh, this quarter, and it really uh, shows this deepening invoice seasonality continues. And the other thing that I would add, and I do think there's one little extra bit of color that I'd like to add, Carl, which is look at that trending just as it is, and then you take a look at the fact that last year in Q217, we had a seasonally soft Q217, and we had a seasonally strong Q317. And so you put that, in, and you look at that result delivered at minus 9% quarter on quarter, and you'll see it perfectly on the graph. But then you put it in juxtaposition to this year in Q3, uh, 18, we have a, uh, you know, I, I obviously we've appropriately guided and we had a very strong Q2. So those are things to think about as well. Uh, but bottom line, that's where we're at. That's what you should, uh, you should consider. Our next question is from the line of Tom Roderick with Stiefel. Hey, gentlemen, thank you for taking my questions. Nice job on the results. So, Keith, you referenced 
a great third act here in your marketing cloud. And if we look at the numbers, I think you said 36% growth at, when you strip out the impact of, of demand wear. So can you just talk a little bit more about what's driving that? What sort of role is, is the Crux DMP playing here? And then, you know, how is the demand wear integration sort of serve to pull through uh, core growth on the marketing side around the, the B2C business. Just love to hear a little bit more about that. Thank you. Yeah, so there's a lot in there. So I appreciate the, uh, the question. So let me just start by saying that we're absolutely thrilled with the acquisitions that we've made. Uh, and they have worked out very strategically, not just in our financial results, but more importantly with our customers driving success. Uh, if you think about the product portfolio and our pivot here towards more vertical uh, in a, uh, uh, orientation, you know, the assembly of marketing cloud plus, uh, plus Crux plus demandware plus commerce cloud is a very, very nice portfolio. I mean, if you think about the companies that we're doing business with, you know, we talked about Caring, um, we talked about Carpour, we talked about Group Auchan, we talked about uh, Sephora. I mean, we just continue to, uh, to ring up a, quite a roster of some of the world's leading retailers. And it, it's not just retailers, by the way, because every company is trying to go from for example, B2B to B2B to C or directly to B2C. And that's where they buy into our vision uh, and what these products bring to bear. So uh, they, they are clearly resonating from a transformation perspective with their customers, not just in the retail space, uh, but in other companies who are trying to become more consumer oriented, who are trying to get uh, more insights around their customers or just connecting to their customers uh, like they've never been able to do before. As far as the integrations uh, are going, we're thrilled. Uh, with the way that the integrations have gone. I, I think we all know that uh, integrations can be difficult. Uh, they can be fraught with risk. There's lots of complexities associated with those integrations. Uh, and, you know, we've, uh, we've certainly cut our teeth on a number of acquisitions. And uh, no integration is perfect, but I will tell you, uh, with Crux um, and Commerce Cloud, we're thrilled uh, with the way those integrations have gone. And we continue to invest uh, in those products more than those companies would have invested in themselves had they remained standalone. And, and again, you're seeing it with the market penetration. Just to give you an example, Mark alluded to earlier uh, that uh, we're investing in, uh, in our second half. Well, one of the things that we're doing is we're doubling down on the sales force associated with the commerce spot because we see the opportunity uh, for, that, for that particular product. So the net net is I think we've assembled a really great core set of products uh, whether it's Crux individually, whether it's uh, Marketing Cloud, which has performed marvelously for us over the last four years, uh, or whether it's a Commerce Cloud acquisition uh, that is resonating with our customers, and that's why you're seeing such great results. Our next question is from the line of Sarah Henlon with McGuire. All right, thank you very much, it's McCory. Uh, thanks for taking my question, guys, and congrats on that really, really nice quarter. I want to dig into a few areas with um, both Marks. Um, I'll start with you, Mark Benioff. Um, I want to pick your brain on the overall macro backdrop and um, how you're seeing in particular the federal vertical. Um, are you seeing anything going on around uh, potential debt ceilings and anything there uh, um, in regards to the federal segment? And then for Mark H., um, hi, Mark. Uh, I just wanted to talk to you a little bit about the channel work we're doing and finding, which is, some nice early ASP uplift from new adopters of Einstein, um, in particular in services and sales as well. So I, I really want to uh, talk to you about what your Einstein strategy, where it's evolving, and how you see that uptake uh, impacting the financials going forward. Yeah, well, first of all, I think that, you know, you can see this uh, great win with the Veterans Administration uh, this quarter is an indication that the uh, uh, government vertical is working uh, better than we expected. You know, we've uh, organized by specialized verticals. One I mentioned was financial services we've, and built products there. We've also organized by healthcare. We've also built products there. A third one is government, and we've built products there. And um, I think our win with the veterans uh, this quarter, I think all of us know that uh, nobody delivers better systems and better customer service than our veterans. And that's why we were so excited to be able to al align with the um, agency to be able to build these next generation uh, systems for them. And I, I uh, think we started to see government spending come back online uh, this quarter really for the first time. And so we're very excited about what the future can mean as the government looks to kind of build next generation systems, looks to move to the cloud, 
and provide better uh, service and support to its customers. Okay, and the second part, uh, sir, I'm happy to take as well here, and maybe Keith, you might want to jump into on the uh, channel work that you were doing. I, I think the you know the first thing I would say is that uh, Einstein is early days, uh, sir. But you know, with that being noted, uh, to your point, you know, we do see opportunity. You know, some of the Einstein capability is built into you know all aspects of our clouds, and some of it is incremental SKUs where there's you know the, the value is such that there'll be incremental you know, money on those SKUs as well to deliver that specific value. And so there'll be a combination of those two. Everything gets smarter, and then some things will have even more uh, SKUs that will create even more solutions for our customers, which obviously, if done well, creates great growth opportunity for us. And that's, that's the way we think about it, and I think that's the way it'll show up in the financials. And, uh, you know, Keith, you know, maybe you want to elaborate a little on that. Well, I, just, I want to go back to the, the Mark's comments about the Veterans Administration. I mean, our public sector team... Uh, is one of our highest performing organizations in the company. And they've had, uh, over the last four years, uh, they, they, have, uh, they have done incredibly well um, in terms of expanding their capabilities in all branches of the government, both federal and state and local. Uh, and that has been very, very exciting for us. I think we all know that the, the government is trying to undertake some sort of digital transformation. This is nothing new. It actually started under the, you know, for certainly started under the Obama administration. And the CIO under the Obama administration was one of our former employees, and he was very keen on introducing the cloud to the federal government. So we've just picked that up uh, and continued, but uh, uh, it's clear that uh, the government is really trying to accelerate that digital transformation, and that's why the Veterans Administration is, you know, yet again another example of, of, uh, of trying to drive that transformation leveraging our technology. Our last question is from the line of Kurt Matrine with Evercore ISI. Uh, yes, thanks very much, and congrats on the quarter. Keith, I want to follow up on a comment you made around AWS and the partnership there in Canada. Uh, when we've talked to some bigger financial institutions, data privacy has been something that's come up as maybe you know something that's been a, a bit of a um, you know, glue in the machine in terms of feeling comfortable adopting uh, Salesforce. You know, it seems that this partnership is opening up that, and as you look across other geos, especially with, you know, say, financial services customers, do you feel like that, that partnership is going to give you a lot of leverage and, and hopefully, you know, accelerate maybe some deals that we're, we're stuck on some localization questions? Thanks. Uh, first of all, thanks for the question. It's great to hear from you. So, look, we have a great partnership with AWS. Uh, they're one of our largest customers. We continue to build that, that partnership out with them, so we're, we're thrilled about that. Uh, and, of course, we've chosen them as our platform in Canada um, and, you know, plans for the second half of the year in Australia. Uh, you know, there, I think there's a lot of synergies there in the eyes of financial services customers as well as other customers outside of the industry, um, and we're going to continue to leverage that. Um, some of these customers are already AWS customers, so there's a natural comfort level as well. Uh, so, you know, look, I, I think at the end of the day, having a strong partner, having a set of uh, very strategic partnerships is a great thing. Obviously, AWS is one. We have strong partnerships with others, like IBM is another. Um, and those things help to play out very nicely for our customers. But, you know, AWS, uh, that relationship is strong, um, and that just gives us a lot of flexibility as we continue to focus and expand internationally. Yeah, and, and as you mentioned, IBM, we continue to get more and more uh, integrations with IBM. we had some great early successes with Watson, and uh, you know our our opportunities are to work with all these amazing uh, companies to deliver a solution that you know serves our customers. And I think we've been probably done a better job, I think, than you know forming these strategic alliances and maintaining them than probably any other company in the industry. I think it's one of the reasons we had such a a great quarter. Well, anyway, thank you everyone for a great call. And, um, you know, we couldn't be more excited. As I said, I think this is probably our best quarter ever. It's far exceeded our expectations. We're thrilled to raise guidance for the year and uh, set our uh, next dream uh, as $20 billion. And here we go. Thank you. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, this does conclude today's conference call. You may now disconnect.